the body has been um, that the focus for me is no longer on the notion of, of, uh, of examining the psyche or the self, but seeing the body uh, more as a structure, not to see the body as a site for uh, a soul or for social inscription, but rather to see the body as an object, not an object of desire, but an object for designing, for redesigning. Uh, for me, the, the body is, is obsolete. I'm not talking about only my particular body, which is, <laughs> uh, someone quite rightly pointed out one day. Um, but the notion that, um, that uh, we've created both um, an information and technological terrain uh, that uh, outmatches uh, the body. Uh, you know, we've had this mad Aristotelian urge for the last 2,000 years to collect more and more information. This information is increasingly alien and uh, it's information that we can't subjectively experience anymore. We can't experience uh, nanoseconds or nebulas. Uh, I mean, if we stood here and counted to a billion, it would take us over 33 years. We can't subject subjectively experience those, those bits of information. And for me, that's an evolutionary crisis. As information becomes more alien, the human body has no operational realm uh, to, to, to creatively process. And of course, it's developed a technological terrain where machines often outmatch the body's performance in speed, precision, and uh, 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 the manipulation of, of data. Um, and technology does one more thing. It speeds up the body, it accelerates the body to the point where it attains planetary escape velocity. I mean, now bodies are going so fast they can leave the Earth. And uh, bodies that uh, leave the Earth are certainly biologically ill-equipped to cope. So it's this intense, intense information field uh, the technological terrain and the extraterrestrial space that we find ourselves in that makes our bodies profoundly obsolete. We're at the limits of um, philosophy, not because we're at the limits of language, but because we're fundamentally constrained by our physiology. The first signs of an alien intelligence will come from a body other than this biological one. It will be either from a hybrid human machine body or for, for a totally, from a totally machine body. Um, in fact, someone at MIT um, sort of made the cynical ob observation that um, if computers can communicate, they can also conspire. <laughs> and uh, although I see that as a projection, <laughs> although I see that as a projection of, of sort of human emotions and fears, uh, nonetheless, uh, it's an interesting sort of uh, notion to play with. So the human body then has to be seen not as simply a particular biological structure, but one that's extended by technology. It always has been. The body has always been incomplete. Uh, the human body, um, right from the beginning of, 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 uh, of, of uh, being a hominid, uh, being a bipedal creature, um, it's an astounding situation, you know, from creatures scurrying around on all four legs to suddenly, or suddenly in evolutionary terms, stand up and all of a sudden two limbs are manipulated. Two limbs are free to, 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 to make things, to produce artefacts. And um, what determines our, uh, what is human is in fact the production of artefacts the making of instruments, uh, uh, the, 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 the use of machines. Uh, technology isn't an alien thing. We shouldn't have a Frankensteinian fear uh, about using technology, uh, nor should we think of it as a kind of Faustian bargain in which somehow we lose our humanity uh, because we, we, we tamper with technology. So uh, how can we look at the body and then consider it uh, uh, obsolete? Well. I mean, the human body, of course, is very subtle, a very complicated uh, and complex uh, carbon chemistry. But this human body also malfunctions often, is susceptible to disease, can't do minutes without air, days without water, weeks without food. 
If its internal temperature oscillates more than three or four degrees, it's in danger of dying. If it loses 10% of its body fluid, it's dead. The survival parameters of the body are very slim. The body malfunctions and is not very durable. We live an average of 80 years, a ridiculously short span of time. So uh, we have to consider how to make the body more durable, how to, how to extend, its, uh, how to extend uh, the body's uh, longevity. And uh, this has got nothing to do with a kind of, uh, uh, of a sort of a, a, a sort of a transcendental urge. You know, it's become now post-evolutionary imperative that we have to somehow significantly extend uh, the lifespan of the body, because a body in, in, in this particular form with these particular functions um, is, is, is inadequate. Um, I'll start showing the, the visual material now because um, uh, I can uh, bring in some of these uh, ideas as we go along. Please interrupt me with questions if, if, you, if you have them. Um, I'm not going to be phased out. Uh, it's just the questions though should be fairly short and I'll try to give a short answer. Otherwise, uh, it gets uh, it gets too too much. Um, I'll start with uh, a videotape uh, which shows some of the suspension events, and um, uh, I'll talk about the slides as we go along. So originally the performances were really about determining the physical parameters of the body. Um, in this performance, uh, um, the body was compressed between two planks of wood. I sewed my lips and eyelids up the surgical needle and thread and tried to stay there for a week and lasted for three days. Uh, the first suspension event uh, with insertions into the skin. Uh, this was in Munich. Uh, the first series of suspension events were rotating the body in space. Um, later on with the seaside suspension, uh, the important thing was uh, plugging the body into different uh, spatial locations and kind of uh, seeing the body as a kind of a sculptural element um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a installation. Uh, this integrity icosahedron structure uh, none of the pieces of wood or the body are touching. Everything is held together by the tension of the cables. Um, an abandoned lift well hoisted up and down about 70 feet. Um, and in this performance, uh, it lasted about 30 minutes. Uh, a sitting suspension. Uh, we use a 4 to 1 ratio pulley structure so the body could hoist itself up. Normally it needed assistance, and in this case, uh, although you felt the same physical difficulty, your body was only a, a quarter of its weight when you lifted it up. It was a, it was a very strange experience. Uh, the body's weight here is counterbalanced by the ring of rocks. Um, in fact, the body was gently swaying from side to side, setting up random oscillations of the rocks. Uh, so it wasn't simply a static piece. And in Copenhagen, in the videotape, uh, the, body, the body is being hoisted up uh, 200 feet uh, using a, large, a giant crane. Um, it was one of the few public performances. I mean, all of these performances were pretty well done in private, uh, but because this one occurred in a city, uh, well, then people were around. A spinning suspension. Seaside one. I guess here the body's attention or awareness was sliding between the serenity of the horizon and sort of uh, the waves crashing below it. Um, the body was suspended side on looking towards the horizon and uh, but what looked so serene in the distance was in fact fairly tumultuous and it was a fairly windy day so the body was kind of blowing around a little bit. What simple question? Does that hurt? What <laughs> 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 Yeah. Well, well, it does. It is physically difficult, and uh, uh, there was certainly no anaesthetic or anything else taken uh, to subdue the pain, and there's no special technique. Um, I mean, I've never been to India or. <laughs> 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 it seems to be sustainable in a way. 
decidable. Uh, uh, maybe the wrong word to add to the Yeah. Well, I think, I think there was a, always a very fine line between whether the performance happened or not. <laughs> Um, in this case, uh, well, we, we, we dug up the roots of the tree, and um, uh, so the whole structure looked a lot less stable, and the body of weight was actually uh, held by the root structure. So cords came from the body over the branches to the root structure. The whole thing looked a, a more circular, less stable sort of a, a structure. And the problem with this performance was, in fact, uh, when we uh, exposed the roots of the tree, about five feet down, um, we, we sort of, in, in Australia, there are very large ants called bull ants. And um, we had disturbed some bull ants' nests. And uh, when we were doing the insertions down below, uh, we had all sorts of trouble with, with those large ants. Um, this was in New York, um, between, that was 11th Street, um, in East Village. And this was between two buildings over a street. And again, this is one of the few sort of public performances simply because it was in the city. Uh, but the body was connected up in a, in a fourth floor room. And when everything was ready, we dropped a cable down the side of the building. Someone picked up the cable, ran across the road, uh, up the fire escape stairs, you know, uh, tensed the cable across the street. And then the body was connected to a pulley structure. And when everything was ready, the body sort of rolled out and sort of ended up, you know, around about the middle. Um, of course, within about five minutes, there were police cars all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, tried to, we tried to do this for about half an hour, and, uh, but after about 12 minutes. So we, we had locked the downstairs doors, and, um, but, uh, you know, the police sort of broke in pretty quickly, and, and uh, they forced the people to sort of pull me back in. Uh, in this case, um, or what was a bit strange was when I was pulled in, uh, the policeman asked me for my passport. It was a little difficult to get used under the circumstances. In the Copenhagen event, the body is now being uh, 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 swung around. It was um, hoisted up, uh, shuffled to the end of the crane arm, and then rotated around. So there was four rotations. This tape will uh, finish now. What I want to do is just put on a little bit of sound for this next tape. Uh, this was a performance where the third hand was attached and um, uh, body signals and sounds were amplified and the body controlled its up and down movement. <laughs> Um, 
I won't bother about focusing on them all the time. Um, so, so, so a background to some of the uh, prosthetic devices. So this is a German hand with only a pinch release mechanism. Uh, a hydraulic hand in Japan, which is more interesting because it's got five fingers. A uh, hydraulic arm, which is quieter and more powerful than the electric servo motor controlled arms. Um, uh, one of the most interesting uh, arms that I know about, which is a, uh, a voice activated arm. It has 21 degrees of freedom, so you can't really control it with your muscles too easily. So you tell your arm what to do. Uh, one word, drink, might trigger forward, grasp, back, wrist rotate, wrist rotate down. Uh, the problem that they quickly found out was that anybody could tell your arm what to do, <laughs> which uh, reduced, the, reduced the problem. But they also tried, um, they also tried things like um, contact microphones on the larynx, so the person could hum a tune. They had it on a, a thalidomide girl uh, when I saw it. Uh, but uh, she could hum a tune and make her, her arm move, and there's some of the commands. Uh, a Nitinol hand developed by Hitachi, uh, no motors. Nitinol is a shape memory alloy. You heat it up by passing electric current through, the metal shrinks. The hand closes. <laughs> the problem is releasing the grip because it's not as quick to kill the, uh, kill the wires. <laughs> So you can grab something and hold it tight, but uh, not so easy to release the grip. Um, a software system with a fairly ordinary robot arm but that can produce a fairly interesting portraits. Um, the Wasada robot that can bl play a keyboard. Um, it has a, 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 it can uh, control the pedals with its feet. It can tap the keyboard at the rate of 16 taps per second. Um, it has a vision system and a software system that enables it to read middle order music and it performed with the Tokyo Symphony Orchestra at the uh, School of Science Exposition. Mm. <laughs> 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 well, you know, it's, it's, it's of course, uh, it's, it's limited and of course uh, it couldn't play something like a piano. Uh, but for an organ, um, you know, it plays fast enough and it, and it has, its arms can move across the keyboard. So it can play, uh, you know, fairly complex tunes, but, but uh, <laughs> not with any of its own rhythm section. I'm sorry? An organ has its own rhythm section. The third hand initially was very much just a visual attachment to the body. Um, I mean, that was interesting enough for me. Uh, but having three arms, three hands, there was a temptation to find some use for it. So the idea of drawing the three hands simultaneously, so we're drawing here a circle, a square and a triangle simultaneously, a fairly square circle, a roundish square, <laughs> an indescribable triangle, but you know, you can make them out. Uh, writing three letters is a bit more perplexing, um, and writing one word with three hands simultaneously produced a problem because uh, in this case the hand depended on the spacing of the three hands. So you act actually had to write every third letter. So the, th the first three letters you wrote were E, L and I. Then you moved across V, U and O, moved across uh, O, T and N. So you had to remember which letter you were writing. So, so you have to keep your two eyes and your three hands to do it. Not because of the physical, not because of the physical control problems, but because simply of the, of the mental aspect of remembering what letters you were drawing or writing. And of course, each letter uh, you had to sort of try to vary the speed so you would finish each letter approximately at the same time. Uh, doing a performance of the largest TV screen ever built. 40 metres long, 25 metres high. You can see it was visible two kilometres away in daylight. Uh, you can see the figure down below, right? And uh, I could interactively control the images on the screen so I could freeze, split screen and superimpose the images. And um, uh, this performance was really the first one that I used video. Um, those black squares were malfunctioning 
uh, sort of uh, uh, pixels, there were 10,000 of those that constituted uh, the surface of the screen, and they were about each about this size, size of a very large TV screen. 10,000 of those made up the image. Are they electronic? Yes, purely, oh, purely electronic. Uh, this is a remote control performance where my third hand was attached to a host body in, in a Tokyo gallery, another, another Japanese artist. And um, by transmitting my muscle signals, I could remote control the hand attached to another body. And the performance was him counterpointing or synchronizing uh, with the uh, third hand movements transmitted from Yokohama. Um, one of the performances with the laser eyes, the lasers here were, uh, I used to do them with little mirrors stuck on the eyes. It was quite a dangerous situation because if I didn't shoot the laser beams exactly um, onto the mirrors, I'd be in trouble. But in these recent performances, the laser beams are transmitted to the eyes via optic fiber cables and collimating lenses. So the beams are safe for me but dangerous for the audience because I can use much stronger lasers. And in this case, the laser beams have modulated the heartbeat sound. So they're, boom, 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 boom. They're, they're on and off. Boom, 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 boom. And then when you blink and um, uh, move the muscles in your face, you can draw with your eyes. You can draw with the laser beam. So the eyes are active transmitters or generators of images rather than simply passive receptors of light. Can you see? Yes, I can. Yeah. The, the, uh, the optic fiber cable and collimate lenses are arranged in such a way that uh, I can see. If you hold something close to your eye too, there's a sort of blur. I mean, you can actually see through it, even though uh, seemingly there's an obstruction in front of it. So uh, it was, it's, it's pretty interesting to seemingly have the, these beams coming from your eyes. And then by blinking, you know, you're jerking the, the, the laser, laser beams around and actually drawing with them. So I can draw circles and, and uh, ellipses uh, just by blinking the eyes fast enough and stuff like that. Uh, in Austria, uh, in Melbourne, some of them. <coughs> the body performing an interactive lights setup. Um, okay, I'm going to change the tape. I've also 
been using uh, industrial robot arms um, as part of video surveillance systems. I'll talk more about that um, as, uh, as the videos catch up to the slides. This performance was at Ars Electronica about two years ago. And in this case, there is a screen positioned above the body. Um, I, can, I have sensors on my arms that enable me to control the switching of cameras positioned above and around the body. So, for example, here you see the top view of the body. Um, and this is done by control with sensors on the, on the arms, leg and, uh, and head. But what was interesting about this performance was during the performance live, I had inserted an endoscope 80 centimetres into my stomach and I was able to switch from external views of the body to a live internal view of the stomach. And you can see the line of the internal view of the stomach there. Okay, this was in Helsinki and uh, again shows some of the aspects of the, um, of the uh, robot arm. Um, this is a rather beautiful image which we'll, you'll see on the videotape a little later on where um, on the right hand side you see what the robot camera is seeing. So it's a split screen configuration that I have choreographed and uh, decided upon using. Um, and this is done again by sensors on the body. And uh, the robot arm then uh, is, is uh, seeing or scanning and rotating around the body, providing this uh, close moving image. Another interesting thing about this performance was that using the serial ports of the computer controller, I was able to interactively control the speed of the robot and I could interrupt the continuous program and insert subroutines, sequences of motions that I, I would decide upon. So uh, this robot was um, not simply pre-programmed but could be controlled in speed and could be interrupted and, and uh, uh, my own sequence of motions could be inserted into the program. The problem with this, we discovered the night before the performance, mm -hmm. was the fact that um, um, after interrupting the, pro the, the robot's program um, and after the, the subroutine had finished, the robot wants to go back to the point of interruption <coughs> And it does that in the quickest possible way, <laughs> taking the shortest possible route. And if your head's in the way, you're in trouble. <laughs> so half of this performance was involved with controlling the robot, and half of my actions were involved with trying to avoid being hit. <laughs> um, the videotape now is of, of a performance in uh, Kansas City where the, uh, the, the hydraulic lifting robot arm is connected to the body, taking a lot of the body's weight. So the body is moving, uh, of course constrained by the jointed mechanism of the arm, but a lot of its weight is taken. So the body is able to glide and move uh, fairly effortlessly. And I'll just turn up some of the soundtrack on, on this.
of sound is that there's a structural connection between the body's motions and the sounds that are being produced. So um, if I flick my fingers or twist my arm, I produce muscle signals that are acoustically amplified. Um, if, if I uh, constrict the radial artery of my wrist, I control the uh, blood flow sound from to the blood is being dammed by the constriction. Then if you release uh, uh, relax your hand and, and away, away the pulsing goes again. So what's interesting for me is not to produce sound as simply an aesthetic kind of arbitrary set of decisions, but rather connecting sounds structurally uh, with either the movements of the body or with its internal physiology. Yes? Yeah, these are not um, electrical impulses translated into sounds, but yes. actual sounds are amplified. No, 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 you're right. Primarily, they are uh, signals, electrical signals picked up from the body, and the sounds are, you know, uh, produced by synthesizer. Uh, either analog body signal out to an analog module, or analog signal out to an analog to digital converter, or, or, to, or to MIDI, um, and then you've got a computer software program to, to structure your sound with. Uh, but it's sort, of, it's sort of, for me, um, as long as the sounds are indicative of the functions, uh, then uh, to me that justifies um, that acoustical translation. But it is a translation rather than simply an acoustical um, uh, you know, signal. But did you experiment with the acoustical uh, sounds, the pure sounds? Well, there's really no such thing. I, I mean, certainly at the beginning, I used to have like phono mics, special phono mics to amplify the heartbeat, right? But this produced a very dirty and very sort of, uh, very ordinary sound, you know, uh, boom, 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 boom. I mean, very uninteresting. But with, with uh, measuring the electrical potential, uh, you can get a much cleaner sort of signal. And also, using ultras, ultrasound sensors, you can actually uh, amplify the heart valve opening and closing and the blood rushing through. So it's like... Um, and that's a much more interesting sound translation than just simply a phono mic. Apparently, muscles do produce a very high frequency acoustical sound, uh, but um, you know, it is difficult to amplify, and again, I haven't, I haven't sort of bothered. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it is a possibility in some instances, but mostly you're, you're, you're picking up electrical potential. This is a performance in, in Canada, in Quebec, using soft <coughs> um, software, and the body is controlling its virtual body with a set of eight polymer sensors on the head, shoulders, hips, legs and arms. And the virtual body then basically mimics the motion of the real body. The real body is a capture system for the virtual image. But to make it more interesting, we choreograph virtual camera views to the arm movements. So the left arm going up and down produces uh, or changes virtual camera views from low to high views of the body. And um, moving the right arm 90 degrees produces a 360 degree sweep of the virtual camera. So, for example, as the arm raises up, you get a top view of the body. As you lower the, the arm, you get a sort of a, a lower view. Up goes the arm, down goes the arm. Okay. Um, and if the right arm is swept around, uh, the, the, the virtual body moves around. It's a little jerky because of the computer, computing power needed uh, for this. Um, even using an Onyx or a VGXT with Reality Engine graphics, you know, isn't isn't as fast as you would like. Uh, so, so there is a problem there. How how is this actually presented? Can you project it at the same time? Okay, that's a good question. The body had decided a three by four meter video projection right. screen. So during this, the performance, this, this is actually projected by the side of the. 
Yeah, this is actually what the what the body is choreographing. So yeah. what you're seeing here is is the image that was beside the body. Yeah. You know, so you had this um, interplay between the physical presence of the body and its video and virtual images. Um, and of course, uh, uh, I could sample the, the virtual body or split screen it or superimpose it. to try to design an ambidextrous arm, an arm that has double jointed fingers um, so that the fingers can bend one way to produce a right-handed grip, or they could completely bend the other way to produce a left-handed grip. <laughs> 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 and um, some, of, some of these uh, research um, possibilities that I've had, this in fact is the inside of a, of a, of a, of a helmet uh, which has a grid of 64 electrodes for monitoring your brainwave activity. Now, it's um, <laughs> not how I lost my hair. <laughs> um, not, not, only could, um, not only could you monitor the brainwave activity, but uh, the computer could calculate uh, the three-dimensional volume of the brain and, and um, locate uh, this is the top view, uh, back view and side view. So uh, this program could locate exactly where the brain activity was being initiated from a visual or an acoustical stimulus. Um, and um, the other project that I've been recently involved in is the designing of uh, a sculpture for the inside of my stomach. Now, there are some special problems in designing this. Um, firstly, um, well, actually, I'll show this much better here. There were certain difficulties in, in, in designing this sculpture. Firstly, it had to close as a capsule so it could be inserted in, into the body safely. And this is the size of the thumb, about 15 millimetres in diameter and about 50 millimetres long, closed. So uh, to, to make the mechanism to do that, I had to get a microsurgery instrument maker because some of the components were less than a millimetre thick and had to be drilled and so forth, and a jeweller to actually make the external shell. So in fact the internal mechanism was smaller than what a jeweller could, could cope with and um, a microsurgery instrument maker was, was, was needed. Uh, it had to be made of implant quality materials like titanium, gold, stainless steel and silver. Even though the object was as big as my thumb, it cost about $800 in just the raw materials. <laughs> um, I had considered in fact using copper uh, so I could produce um, a primitive battery inside the acidic contents of the stomach and uh, make this little light bulb uh, turn on and off. Uh, the, problem, the problem was, of course, or the realisation was, of course, that my stomach would probably be copper-coated in this process. <laughs> so um, that wasn't the smart way to go. Here's this beautiful um, uh, movement now with the, uh, the robot and the... Uh, um, the lasers. I'll just switch that off for a moment. So what you're seeing there is what the robot camera is looking at. Um, so the robot camera is picking up, um, you know, a close view of the body, and the movements that you're seeing are the movements of of, of the robot itself. So there's this intriguing sort of surveillance system. Um, of cameras positioned around and above the body and on the robot, and um, everyone is looking at everyone else. You know, the body is monitoring the robot, the robot is monitoring uh, the, the human body, and then the choreography of that sort of interactive motion uh, is brought together um, live. So this is really effectively a live um, uh, editing by the body. It's not a studio editing uh, job that you're seeing here. 
just change the tape um, to the, uh, the stomach sculpture. <coughs> so this stomach sculpture was um, was a, an opening, closing, extending, retracting capsule structure which was also self-illuminating and sound emitting. And um, you can see the sort of relative size of the, um, the open sculpture. Um, and uh, it, it's almost the size of your fist, and it almost fills the stomach when it's uh, insert, inserted and open. You can see the light flashing on and off. There's also a piezo button that provides a beeping sound. Uh, so there is some sound as part of this. And you'll see the capsule now closing, and um, sort of down it goes. <laughs> um, it was pretty difficult to do. It's probably the most difficult thing I've done, and I'm not saying that flippantly at all. Um, in fact, it was the, it's been the only sort of performance I've needed medical assistance with. Uh, we had to do it within 15 minutes of the closest hospital. Because <laughs> uh, um, it was it was a little it was a little um, uh, you know safety was a problem, um, and uh, the in, the internal um, uh, mechanism. I mean, we had to guarantee that electronically this was going to function correctly, and so we did have some LED indicators on the control box. Uh, the control box, of course, is this fairly large unit with a servo motor connecting to a flexi drive cable. Um, but uh, uh, there were there were LED indicators there that, that um, told us if the sculpture was opening, closing, or it was fully opened or not. Uh, because of course it had to be fully closed before it could be pulled out. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was. It would have gotten down to a cesarean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the problem with this with this uh, strategy was, in fact, that the the, the drive cable got too large. Um, the drive cable became eight eight millimeters in diameter, and originally, originally, I uh, this is the drive cable and the uh, uh, and the power power leads. But um, I wanted that really only uh, a maximum of about three millimetres in diameter, and uh, it just got too big. We couldn't get off the shelf flexi drive cable less than five millimetres in diameter, and then with this plastic sheathing, it became uh, uh, you know too large. Then we had to insert the endoscope in there as well to uh, to image the thing. Uh, so it was it was uh, quite a difficult situation. Um, in fact, um, um, there was medical treatment needed that night. Uh, it was a fairly sort of traumatic thing to happen. And of course, um, this was being monitored on the TV uh, monitor next next to the um, the body. So uh, I mean, we could see what was going on, and we could sort of like hand gesture, um, you know, certain things to do or to to to, uh, to, to look at. Um, it took two days and six attempts to film this. And um, you know there were four or five emergency withdrawals uh, because what happened? Even though we had a suction pump pumping out the excess fluids in the stomach, what happened was that um, every now and again the stomach would come, the, the pump wouldn't keep up with the production of, of, of the body fluids, and of course everything would then come up, and uh, you had to quickly withdraw. That's a very very good view of the uh, the, the very end of the stomach. Um, it's like looking at the exit of the stomach, that, that uh, smaller area there, inside there. That's close to the pylorus, which is the exit of the stomach. That's about 80 centimetres into the body. And that's the, uh, the shot there of the pylorus. So um, the idea here was, um, in fact, was uh, just a, 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 a way for me to get into a sculpture triennale. Being a performance artist, I never get never get invited to sculpture triennale. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, last, year, 
last year, the sculpture Triennale had um, had uh, seen site-specific work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I argue that um, this sculpture wouldn't take up any museum space. <laughs> Um, and that it would be the smallest sculpture in the Triennale. And um, anyway, I, I think they were truly interested in the idea and they, they went to a lot of trouble to make sure that it, it happened. Uh, but um, the idea here is that you, you insert an artwork into, inside the body. The body uh, no longer uh, looks at art, no longer performs art, but merely contains art. Uh, the body is not container of a self, but simply of a sculpture. And this was kind of, you know, seductively, uh, it was quite a seductive notion for me. The skin is no longer a barrier between, um, you know, public spaces and private physiological spaces. So this idea of erasing the skin as a barrier or as, or as an adequate interface was uh, an interesting concept. Uh, so the idea of um, implanting technology into the body is something for me that, um, uh, that I'll probably continue in various ways. Of course, it would be great to work on, on a level approaching a nanotechnology level uh, where you might um, uh, quite uh, easily swallow more complex uh, robotic structures, but of course uh, that might be a, a little while yet before I can access those sorts of facilities or, or that sort of technical assistance. What's intriguing for me, of course, in terms of this recent relationship between the body and technology, is this amazing flip that's happened. Totally unpredicted by science fiction in many ways. Um, whereas once technology was external to the body, proliferated into the human landscape, uh, was essentially seen as, as an instrument or a vehicle um, that mediated between the body and the world. Here you have technology now in micro-miniaturised form actually being inserted into the body. They become components of the body rather than uh, being a container of the body. And micro-miniaturised robots, I mean we could even think of recolonising the human body with micro-miniaturised robots, augmenting our bacterial population and viral, and, and viral populations we could have an internal surveillance system. At the moment, the body has no adequate internal surveillance. I mean, you could be sitting here growing a, a, a cancerous tumour in your stomach, you wouldn't know it until the symptoms surface, until it's too late. There's a huge gap between cellular activity and conscious awareness. So the idea of, um, of a colony of robots, of surveillance robots inside the body, would be very intriguing. And whereas once before, biocompatibility was the result of what materials these, these bits of technology were made of, you know, in other words, biocompatible materials, now it's not so much the biocompatibility of the materials, but simply the scale of the technology. If these robots are spec-sized, not only will you be able to swallow them, you won't even be able to sense them. You know? So the notion of robots inhabiting the soft tissue and internal tracts of the body is a total flip in terms of our relationships with machines and it's really only happened in the past decade or so at, at, at a micro level. Yeah. Do you think that the brain is capable to go to that kind of reality? Well, 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 I think so. I mean, um, I think, um, you know, to a large extent, our identity depends on our embodiment. And if we're sort of, for example, half human, half machine, our identity will sort of adjust to a certain degree. Or if, uh, I mean, I had a very strange experience in, um, in, in France um, about a year and a half ago. Um, I gave a talk at a, at a, at a, at a seminar on human-machine uh, um, intelligence and um, uh, at the end of the lecture there was a, uh, a couple of girls came to talk and um, one of them was sort of talking and waving her arms around like French people usually do and I noticed after a while that she had in fact an artificial arm and I didn't sort of realise this, it was fairly well crafted and, um, and she was interested in trying this third hand and we put some electrodes on her body 
and she was quite happy to sort of, because her, her hand, her arm, her cosmetic arm didn't function at all. And at the end of this little little exercise, you know, she seemed sort of fairly happy. And she said, well, do you realise that I, in fact, I have, a, you know, two or three of these arms, uh, you know, because one's always getting damaged and I'm sort of repaired, you know, having them constantly repaired. And uh, she said, uh, would you like one of my arms? And I said, well, yeah, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then and then without any sort of uh, sort of being overly overly conscious of what she was doing, she simply screwed off her arm and sort of handed it over. And it was a very very strange experience when you see this. Um, you know, what you thought was this uh, whole person, and all of a sudden they're handing a part of their body to you. I love to grow. I'm sorry? I love to grow. Well, it's very, I mean, of course, of course what I really wanted was an arm and a leg. But this is, uh, you know, this is, I think, this sort of, in a sense, indirectly answers your question. That um, I think the body can cope, and for her, uh, this this uh, arm was part of her body, but it was a detachable part, and she was not overly uh, self-conscious about, um, you know, handing it over to someone else. And even though I had worked with robotics and prosthetics for about 20 years, I was still quite honestly startled and taken aback. By, by an action like that. Yeah, but it wasn't an independent working thing inside the body. Uh, no, no. This, this, of course, this is different. But, but I think, um, you know, already people have artificial body parts, and um, uh, I think uh, one, uh, you know, as long as one's alive and one can experience this and, and operate in an effectively human way, then if something is, is sort of... Uh, artificial inside of them, it doesn't really make all that much difference, I don't think. Uh, this system I wanted to show it because um, it's a tele, what Tachi in Japan calls a tele-existence system. Now, this is a, a system that uh, helps the uh, human operator control a robot, uh, a robot arm. Now, it's got sound, so I think I might to turn the soundtrack on. <laughs> This is a slave robot for tele-existence, designed to be similar to the human body. The head of the robot incorporates binocular video cameras and stereo microphones. The head orientation is controlled by the operator. The sensation display enables the operator to experience the same sensation visually and auditorily in three dimensions as the robot has acquired. The operator performs the remote task based on the sensation and the slave arm mechanism with seven degrees of freedom achieves the same task by reproducing the operator's motion. The same applies to the pivoting motion. Using the tele existing system, we can easily perform elaborate tasks that have been difficult with conventional robots. Suppose we are given the task of inserting a stick into the targets, which are randomly arranged. Anyone can maneuver the robot easily without any special training, and for the stereo view is exactly the same as with the naked eyes, and the spatial relationship between the eyes and the hand is the same as in the direct to manual operation. Now I showed, I showed that tape uh, to demonstrate a, a concept that 
If the feedback loops between the human operator and the robot are adequate, are of a wide bandwidth, then the human operator effectively becomes the robot. The robot sees what the human operator sees. The robot completes what the human operator initiates. There's a kind of psychological and spatial collapse between the human operator and the remote robot. So he calls this tele-existence. He one-ups Marvin Minsky's notion of tele-presence. Marvin Minsky says you would feel as if you were where the robot was. You would feel as if you were the robot. And Tachi says, no, phenomenologically, you are the robot. You are where the robot is. It's no longer meaningful to talk about simply the intelligence being in the human body because it's an interactive feedback loop, because the robot is semi-autonomous and has some intelligence, right? There is this constant feedback interplay, and so intelligence is distributed throughout the system. The tele-existence system is what's intelligent, not the robot or the body on their own. So this is just a very, very sort of interesting notion and sort of an extension of Minsky's tele-presence. I'm sorry? I mean, what you're now telling that has to do with the fact that your perception is in between. Yes. This is quite a difference that if you want to draw on perception or your perception is generated via another interface. Yes. Well, the thing is, whether, you see, it's a kind of a philosophical argument again. Again, if you're a phenomenologist, then, you know, really what you see, what you experience is what's real. You know, there's no objective reality as such. It's only what you image, which is real. There's a person at the Washington Human Interface Lab, I forget his name, I think it's Brickham, who is doing this work on virtual objects where he's actually drawing on the retina directly with very small laser beams. So he can actually produce stereoscopic images on each of the retina, retinas of the eyes. And so you see, you know, in your field of vision, you know, a virtual object, a 3D sort of virtual object. So this idea of virtual images invading even your real-time space is a possibility. And then, you know, well, is it meaningful to distinguish between that reality and the hyper-reality of VR or the remote reality of a teleoperation system? It's a sublimation. Yeah. But, for example, I have a sensor at the end of my fingertip. That sensor is about one metre away from my brain, right? Of course I'm hardwired rather than telemetry connected, but it takes about half a second for that signal to travel to my brain, be processed, and for me to react, right? This finger pad here is a remote sensor to my brain, to my body, just as the robot effectively, when it's connected adequately by telemetry, a remote end defector of the body. So it's a way of projecting human presence. It's a way of affecting physical action at a distance. But I think this is the essence of the robot, this subject. That where do you put the border of a certain perception and a certain action? And I maintain now that it's no longer meaningful to think of boundaries or surfaces or, you know, really it's a matter of thinking of the body as a kind of a cyber system. You know, the body is connected to internet. It's connected to media systems. It's connected to all sorts of technologies that are stuck on it and extend away from it. So the body now operates in a much wider realm of techno space, of cyber space. Anyway, I mean, it can get... There are arguments. I mean, you know, Dreyfus would argue, you know, from the human standpoint. Morovic would go to an extra extreme and suggest we simply download all our functions and machines anyway. You know, there are variations to philosophically and non-logically analysing those things. I'm wondering whether I can do this. 
I think I can safely do this this way. Am I going to make a huge sound if I insert this?
Um, oh yes. Well, the thing is, of course, this was a balance between the more functions that this hand would have, the more motors it would need, the heavier it would get. So at the moment, it already weighs, uh, you know, one and a half kilos. So you know, it's it's not so heavy, but if you wear it for a day. You know, um, and one thing that it was meant to have was these buttons were, were were meant to control a movement around the arm, which would have added, added tremendously to the flexibility of the hand of the hand movements. But I ran out of money. I spent ten thousand dollars of my own money over a period of four years, and also I got a bit tired. I wanted to start performing with it, and there were re a real uh, there was a realization that this mechanism to turn this whole um, hand and interface unit around the arm would actually become rather heavy. So it would really have to be redesigned. But for example, if I, if I had funding and I was, I was making this hand again, I would make it in such a way that the movement around the arm would be integrated into the design from the very beginning rather than as, as a sort of afterthought that I had. But all this empty space was for that mechanism. Okay, now the final thing that I wanted to, to demonstrate, and uh, Bob, Bob was sort of the most curious and happened to be the first here, so he's going to, he's going to, he's been wired up. And in all of the performances that you've seen on videotape, part of my body was not under my control. The left arm was moving involuntarily. There were two muscle stimulators that were sending, applying voltage to the uh, flexor muscles into the biceps and my, the left side of my body or my left arm was um, uh, uh, was automated, was involuntarily moving. And again, it was interesting to counterpoint the pre-programmed uh, robot movement with the EMG control third hand, uh, with the improvised body actions and then also with this involuntary movement. So, uh, if, if you don't well, have any influence on that at all. Once, once you determine the rate of uh, stimulation and the intensity of stimulation, then your arm is jerking around for the whole 40 minutes of the performance, <laughs> not under your control. It's a very sort of interesting feeling that you can forget that part of your body and yeah. concentrate on something else. <laughs> 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 but, but it's not... Uh, it is a little uncomfortable, and so... <laughs> <laughs> okay, just come, come what I'll do is... Um, now what we're going to do here is... Uh, I'll leave that for the moment. Um, we're going to incrementally turn on up the voltage, and... <laughs> now... No, no, no. <laughs> There are a couple of reasons I didn't do it on myself. Firstly, obviously, I don't have much room for anything else under these circumstances. But also, if I did it to myself, I mean, no one really would be able to appreciate what's happening. I mean, for all you know, I was just lifting my arm up and down. So <laughs> what we're going to do here is, is, just, is just gradually, and, and I'm not going to do this any more than uh, Bob wants, but I'll just gradually turn on the thing and... Uh, what I want you to do is when you feel something, let your, you know, let what, what happened happens. But when there's no signal, bring your arm down again so they visually register what's going on. Okay? Okay? So you can see his arm beginning to move up, just very gradually. Okay? <laughs> no, I won't go through it.
got uh, the uh, electrodes on the extender muscles, which will produce a slightly different motion um, backwards. And But 
I don't think the kind of, um, uh, I mean, I think the classic one is the, the Catholic Church being caught uh, on, the, on the hop with uh, in vitro fertilization. I mean, this was a very altruistic process. I mean, women with blocked fallopian tubes could now have, have um, you know, could now have babies by externally fertilizing the, the egg and replanting it, right? Now, of course, fish have, fish have been doing this all the time, you know, sort of spewing out their eggs and externally <laughs> fertilizing them. The Catholic Church, though, all of a sudden started to say that this was not the right thing to do, um, even though fish were doing it, you know, for millions of years. But the, the, problem, the problem is, of course, or well, people see it, is that in vitro fertilization leads to the next step of nurturing the fetus outside of the womb altogether. Now, there's some philosophically interesting issues here because if you nurture the fetus totally outside of the body, technically, there's no longer any birth. And if you can replace malfunctioning you know, parts of the body with, with replaceable technological parts, technically, there need not be any reason to die. I mean, there, there are catastrophes that will happen that might kill you in the end or kill a, a population or a species. But, but technically, existence is no longer beginning with birth or ending with death. Um, so we have to redefine you know, what it means to be human, what, what it means to exist. And so the idea of existence being more operational rather than this analogue, uh, you know, birthing, maturing, uh, declining, that's me. <laughs> uh, I mean, instead of having this kind of analogue existence, uh, you, you're either operating effectively or you're not, you know. Um, and uh, that's how we might have to sort of redefine what we mean by, by, uh, by, by living. You don't think there could be something like psychic burnout? Um, in, in where you, at, at the moment in time, just um, exist without, create, without creating anything. You, you go on at infinitum and just do a certain thing, kind of things but without really being there. Well, I think uh, it's, it's an interesting question, but, but I always consider mental phenomena, you know, the mind or the psyche as, as a kind of epiphenomena of our sort of neurophysiological you know, structure or our, our bodies. Um, and so uh, to, to me, there's a kind of an inextricable connection between the two. I mean, uh, you know, over the last couple of thousand years in Western philosophy anyway, we've been operating under the metaphysical guise of, 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 of platonic ideals or Cartesian splits between mind and body or, or the more miraculous Leibnizian parallelism where somehow the mind and the body are separate but they're somehow synchronous, you know, clockwork geared by someone above. Um, now that kind of metaphysics of, of seeing the body as a kind of zombie-like thing driven by an, in, an internal soul, I think that's really outmoded metaphysics. And so how can we reevaluate the body uh, without resorting to those sorts of ideas or those sorts of philosophies? It's not easy. Um, I also decided then for us because maybe you or I can think, well, I, I think that that's where that the body is uh, apart from the soul or whatever you call it. Yes. Then if you start to, uh, like, for example, raise children outside of the body, then you choose to that person, they're still human. Yes. So they are made from a uh, human DNA with yes. material. Yes, yes. So and that's what concerns me, you see, because I don't think ultimately <laughs> <laughs> that was the right strategy. Um, <laughs> No, I think, I think um, uh, what concerns me is uh, that even, I mean, birth and death at the moment are kind of evolutionary strategies for, for two reasons, for shuffling genetic material and for controlling the population. But um, after we leave the enclosed biosphere of the Earth, for example, population control is a ludicrous concept. You know, I mean, the universe is an immensely empty space um, and so the notion of, of perpetuating uh, intelligence or spreading intelligence, uh, whichever body form it takes, uh, means uh, that an out, outdated 
evolutionary strategies like birth and death won't any longer apply. And uh, uh, shuffling genetic material only produces a kind of difference in appearance. It doesn't produce any radical redesign of the body. There is one strategy that I kind of uh, think is kind of interesting. When I was looking at the body, it's very complex. I mean, how could you redesign the body? And, and when I was reading some, some evol uh, papers on evolution, um, you know, the difference between running on four legs and then suddenly being uh, bipedal is actually not so much anatomical difference. Apparently, the upper thigh muscles and lower and lower back muscles were the only things that were modified to produce bipedalism. And, and I, was, I was amazed that bipedalism was the result of only very minor, relatively minor anatomical changes, you know, in, in musculature. So I thought, well, what if we, for example, changed our skin, right? What if we generated or made a synthetic skin? And this synthetic skin only had two properties. One property was that it was permeable to oxygen, right? That oxygen could permeate this, this skin, this membrane. And secondly, this skin had a kind of sophisticated photosynthetic capability. It could convert sunlight and moisture into chemical nutrients into the body. Right? I mean, plants do it. Why can't we do it? Plants are only one. Plants are only. Plants are only one percent efficient. Right? So imagine if we made a synthetic skin with only those two characteristics. You know, and we were able to shed this skin. And, and wear this new skin, what would happen? We would radically redesign the body. We wouldn't need lungs to breathe. We, we wouldn't need a gastrointestinal tract to digest food. We wouldn't need a circulatory system to convey oxygen and nutrients throughout the body. We could radically redesign the body. We could hollow out the human body. And a hollow body, for me, was a seductive concept because we could pack more tickle like everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so um, you know, there was a sort of a strategy. You know, all you have to do is a change of skin, and you could radically redesign the body. Uh, so uh, off the earth, the softness, the wetness, the complexity of the body would be difficult to sustain because we don't have air, we don't have water in that in that abundance off the earth. So the strategy would be to hollow, harden, and dehydrate the body. That's the next question. Yes. Well, the thing is. The, the definition of what it is to be human, of course, is, is constantly changing. And, um, you know, you, you would be burnt at the stake as a witch if you had a pig's heart in, in you, a hundred, even a hundred years ago, uh, or an artificial heart, or, or a prosthetic hand. I mean, you would be burnt at the stake. For example, you want to get to explore the rest of the universe. For example, if you want to uh, uh, let people uh, sit on Mars for a year just to discover what's there, why should you be human? I mean, you can also... Oh, yes, you can. Yeah. There, are two, there are two basic strategies. Humans can be sort of re-engineered extraterrestrial explorers, or humans can be simply kind of master controllers sitting on Earth remote controlling surrogate robots. And, and sort of gathering information that way. And of course, we do that with our satellites already. I mean, basically, we're just sort of sitting safely in our biosphere. We're sending out robot satellites and we're, we're sort of harvesting information, you know. But, but for me, what's interesting, of course, is, is to operate in alternate spaces and alternate environments. Well, I find it incredibly obviously, really, and you're, you're busy so physically. You're busy with your body all the time, and it's really physically. And at the same time, you're busy with ro robots. It's, it's, it's uh, I mean, it, in your case, it's. Sometimes it's, a robot wins. It's hit me, I mean, it's an amazing combination. I mean, in, in other situations, usually the robot is there, and there's this physical aspect is sort of missing. But it's, and the thing is, uh, normally, of course, it's not safe to be within the task envelope of the robot. I mean, usually I have to sign, you know, sort of forms accepting full responsibility and, and, and you know, so, so the company doesn't get into trouble. But normally, of course, within the task envelope of the robot, I mean, if the robot hits you at full speed, you know, you're in real serious trouble. But the point is, what's interesting for me is to try to cope with the complexity of different interactive systems. So you've got, you know, sort of, video, virtual, robotic, uh, involuntary motion. And all of these are kind of being looped and cross-wired. Like, for example, um, an angle transducer on my leg 
uh, would modulate and switch my brain waves on and off. You know, uh, my, my leg muscles are controlling my, my hand movements. My, uh, tilting my head would switch the camera above on. You know, so the choreography of, of all that um, is, is coping with the complexity of, of the system. And that's what makes it interesting as a live performance. Sometimes things work well and sometimes not so well. But, you know, that's, it's not a predictable, rehearsed sort of situation. We generally get the technology a couple of days before and it takes us a day to hardwire everything. And then we practice maybe the, the system the night before. We, never, we can never sort of do a performance in total before. Uh, and, and then it happens and you try to sort of wing it as best you can. Okay, I think maybe that's gone quite long enough. Thanks for coming. And uh, I'd like to thank Stein for inviting me here. And, um, uh, and, and certainly it was a, a, a very good uh, week um, here in Amsterdam. Thanks very much. <laughs>